Um, everyone, thank you very much for coming to this session. So, um, so my name is Sebastian. I'm the founder and CEO of, of Scalar, and uh, Scalar is this um, uh, abstraction layer. It's called the Cloud Management Platform, um, and it uh, allows you to manage public and private clouds. And when when we've been building this platform, we've seen a lot of people that have been um, building hybrid clouds, and so we've I've been exposed to a lot of um, myths of or false expectations of what hybrid cloud means. So, so we put together a really nice panel for you today uh, with, with some industry leaders that have, been, have uh, uh, real experience building hybrid clouds. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce you to Anthony Skinner, who's the CTO at Moz, um, and has, been, has migrated workloads from Amazon to OpenStack, and will be able to contribute his real world experience there. Do you want to add a little thing, anything to that? No, nope, that was perfect. That's, that's perfect? Yep, All right. Uh, after that, uh, I'd like to introduce you to Mark Williams. Mark Williams is the uh, um, currently leading the uh, application modernization practice at Redapt. Prior to that, he was the uh, very first operations engineer at Zynga and grew their, um, uh, their, their uh, cloud usage on Amazon and then their mi subsequent mi uh, migration to CloudStack. Um, and very last, I'd like to introduce you. Oh, anything to add? Good. All right. We'll get to the details okay. later. <laughs> and then I'd like to introduce you to Randy Bias. Randy Bias is the founder and CTO, uh, and CEO, all three, of Cloud Scaling that was recently acquired by EMC um, and has a lot of experience around building API compatibility for OpenStack uh, and getting that to work well with, uh, with public cloud providers. Um, so uh, the very first question that I have for our distinguished panel is um, around application portability. So let's say that I, I build an application and I want to be able to move that from one provider to another. Is that easy? How, how, what do I need to look out for? Well, it's just drag and drop, right? So <laughs> All right, next question. Next que yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's certainly a lot of marketing out there that, that leads you to believe that it is as, as simple as it sounds. And in some ways, uh, when I was at Zynga, my colleague uh, and I were often professing kind of what we were doing at, uh, with hybrid cloud and, and very much so. It, it was kind of more like teenage sex. Everybody <laughs> was talking about it. Very few people were doing it. And it, in reality, for us as a gaming company, it was very hard, mm -hmm. even considering our applications were already cloud native. So, you know, when you, when, as, especially as an operations person, when you care about uptime and, you know, the fluidity of moving games between clouds, is, or in our case, games between clouds, was r very hard. It would take us about seven weeks once we got good at it. You know, the, the first few tenets were, were very challenging to kind of, A, get comfortable with moving into a private cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's often trust issues and fear. You know, everybody's happy, especially if, if you already, if you, most of you are already consuming a lot of public cloud, it's hard to get your, your tenets to move. So there are some tricks to to doing that, but it, it does take a while. Randy? Um, sorry, I'm glad you asked about application portability because mm -hmm. I feel like that's at the, at the center of what people are asking for when they ask for hybrid cloud. Like I, you know, what I see is that that's the hidden assumption. Like I, I, I've got my folks, so I'm moving over to a DevOps process and doing continuous integration to co continuous deployment. And I just want to figure out, you know, kind of a, a, a build and release cycle for my application or application backend that makes sense. And I want it to work on this cloud or that cloud. And maybe you're doing dev test and QA inside, and maybe you're doing it outside, maybe it's production inside, maybe it's production outside. People kind of want to mix and match, but then they're hoping that it just works. They're hoping for the sort of magic bullet. And then I think the problem is that, uh, is that there really is no magic bullet. Like uh, clouds have to be built with intent. If they're not built with intent, then what happens is you wind up where one cloud has dramatically different performance characteristics or dramatically different cost from the other one, and then you don't get what you hope for, which is that application portability where it just works. You, you, also, um, you also talked a lot about repatriation of workloads. Um, does that, like, is that something you have to like, specifically arch arch architect for, or is that what you're touching upon? Yeah, I mean, uh, repatriation is uh, just a term that we came up with with folks who go out to public cloud and they start there and then they want to come back. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they go through that repatriation process. And, you know, that's where we got some of our early traction with companies like Ubisoft. They're deploying games on Amazon. Then at some point the game's flatline. They're not growing anymore. And so they want to bring them back and cost optimize them. And they need to make sure that as they target, you know, for their development deployment systems from Amazon to their internal private cloud that, you know, the right thing happens when they, when they, uh, you know, push the button. 
Anthony, you have a lot of experience in repatriating workloads. Can you talk about that? Yeah, no, absolutely we do. So at Moz, we were about uh, a run rate at Amazon between 700000 up to close to eight to $900,000 a month. And so at some point, we started to pull back. <laughs> That's right? hard. It made, made sense to do for us. And uh, as, as they said before, I think it's a lot harder than people think. And I, I think even when you're inside of your own cloud and it's private, I think you have to pay attention to the boxes that are coming in, right? So one release of a Dell box isn't the same as the next, right? And same with Cisco. We have both types of gear. And so you have to test those and ensure they run it because each one of those will actually do different things. And for us, we actually rip those boxes down to be nothing but bare metal and ensure we're putting our stuff on it. And even then, that it's still very hard to, to actually do. So it takes a bit of work. And for us, given our size, we already had a DevOps team. So managing it at Amazon or managing it on site didn't necessarily matter to us. It was really how could we find a way for our developers to push a button and deploy regardless of where it was so they can just provision work. Cool. So um, are there any other myths or things that you hear a lot about in the press that, that are your pet peeves, some things that, you, that are very incorrect that, that, um, that you'd like to clarify? I mean, one thing that kind of drives me a little nutty is um, when people in the enterprise vendors, I guess I'm an enterprise vendor now, <laughs> um, the, a lot of the sort of traditional vendors, they have a, uh, they get really sort of, they, they come up with these ideas that don't really make a lot of sense. Like I'm going to take an Ethernet segment, like a layer two Ethernet segment, and I'm going to stretch it across the wide area network and, you know, put my databases over here oh, and put yeah. this other stuff in the cloud without any, like, you know, taking into account that, like, hey, latency is latency, the speed of light is speed of light. You know, it's not going away. <laughs> and there's just sort of this pretend. Now I've got, you know, hybrid cloud because i got the database in my private cloud and i got the web app servers here, but, you know, that's never going to work. Um, there is a case for that layer two Ethernet bridging thing, but it's just it's it's really a niche thing. Yeah, one of my pet peeves is cloud bursting, uh, and that that's kind of that. Like, let, let I've got my databases here, but let's burst out to the public cloud for the spike. And the problem is that you're paying for bandwidth between public and private cloud, and like what you're the, the few cents you're saving by putting your 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 extra compute on on Amazon, um, you're getting hit by the amount of traffic that has to go between your database tiers and, and applications. Yeah, I was going to pick that one too. I've also <laughs> heard it. I've heard of it. I heard that referred to as spillover. Spillover, this, yeah. It's and I'm spillover like, wow, group, spillover. Yeah. It sounds like an accident. Um, <laughs> and again, you, know, you, know, you mentioned, you know, I have seen a couple companies get into a situation where they've had to put something that was workload intensive in a either cloud or non-cloud bare metal situation to get around you know, surprises in the cloud, which are good problems to have. Mm -hmm. um, and so they've been kind of left with that, that situation of effectively being hybrid. But the, even the term hybrid to me, uh, we, we at Zynga did actually do one application that was split across uh, both our private cloud and our public mm -hmm. cloud just to say, okay, we know how to do this in case we really run out of capacity. But for us, the, the more appropriate term that we uh, centered around was multi-cloud. So you want to have those same tools, those same front ends to be able to operate both your private and your public in the same way and to enable your developers and, and we are a very decentralized operations organization so en enable everybody to uh, operate both of those equally but when it, while we were doing this experiment with this one app where it was in two clouds it was we just realized how insane it was. There are so many moving parts you have so many more things that can go wrong, and it's fundamentally more complex than it needs to be. So for us, it was multi-cloud, put workloads that are known in one, different workloads in another. So, uh, so I guess like another myth would be that like workloads need to be either public or private, but you don't have workloads that span two, uh, two providers. Is that what? If, I, if you care about simplicity, and yeah. if you care about scale, and you care about eliminating things that when, when there's an anomaly, which especially in public clouds, there's anomalies more often than not because you, you don't know what else is happening. You don't have that full transparency. Again, as operations people, you want to know what that anomaly is. You want to have as few things to eliminate as possible. Yeah, no, I, I oh, agree, okay, go ahead. No, I agree with that as well. I, for us, bursting isn't bursting from one cloud to the other. It's really what applications are running where and then being able to add mm -hmm. capacity. And so I, you know, I totally agree. So, so did you have a workload that was, the, the, the single workload you had, was that, did that span Amazon during that transition period? No, absolutely not. We have really one running in one place and one running in the other, and then we also have backups. We also have backups that are running in two different places, right? So, but they don't really span. Uh, two things. So first is, I just want to caution us all to not paint with too broad a brush, right? If you say something like, you know, spanning workloads across clouds doesn't make sense. It, 
kind of depends on the workload, because if you walk away from compute, having an object storage in two clouds makes a lot of sense in doing mm -hmm. replication. That's a very good them. point. You know, you could, if you have your system, your store data of record in Amazon S3, and you want to have it in Google as well, so that in case you need to do a disaster recovery failover, then that's a, that's a great application, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And, and, and that's what we do. Exactly. Right. So. And then the second thing is, is that, you know, bursting could work, but it's kind of like I said, you have to kind of build with intent. So you'd have to put your private cloud very, very close to the public cloud, like, mm -hmm. you know, and have like Metro Ethernet, very low latency, very high bandwidth for it to actually make sense. And again, it kind of comes down to the question of, do you really have an application that needs that, or can you plan ahead so that you can have the parts in different clouds? And then, as Anthony was saying, kind of expand each one, you know, scale each one independently of each other. To, to back up to your original question as well, some of the myths that uh, you often hear when people come talk to you, if you're private or public or one or the other, uh, is that as, a, as individuals we actually care? Mm -hmm. Actually, we don't really care. What we care about is cost and stability and performance, right? Yeah. And, and as long as you have those things, it doesn't necessarily matter where it runs. And, and, and your point, Mark, was that if you have a workload that, that's not really suited to be on both, then troubleshooting becomes very difficult and that, that affects stability. Yeah, I'll reflect on cost as well. You know, it, it, especially for those of you who are big public cloud consumers and you're aspiring or, or beginning to build those private clouds, again, getting the first tenant to want to move in is tough, but ultimately you're accountable to the CFO and the fact that you've invested so much time and capital in that private cloud will eventually force the right thing to happen, which is to get uh, your tenants moved into it. That kind of threat alone may not be enough. And, and for those of you who are working to get chargeback or showback, that's actually the tool where, you know, if you if you demonstrate the cost savings that you've you've invested in that in that private cloud compared to your public cloud costs, that's that's kind of the carrot or hammer, however you want to look at it, to, to get that change. Yeah, no, absolutely. For for us, the developers, they were kicking and dragging and not wanting to go. And I think once they saw how easy it was and how much better the performance was once we got out and the overall cost, they, you know, no one really wants to spin up a box at Amazon or else at this point. It's really, if you have to do it, you will go do it. And I think for us, one of the things we're still working out is the DevOps side of it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, anyone could go push anything at Amazon and just have it run and cost us tons of money. <laughs> it's a little bit harder in internally, right? Because yeah. there's only so many boxes. So we still have to manage that piece as well. By the way, this is really a session for, for you guys out here in the audience. If you have any questions, either raise your hand or go to a microphone. We'll, we'll be happy to, to, to take that. Um, so one thing I, I've seen a lot uh, in the last, uh, maybe last 12 months or so, is that hybrid cloud really seems to mean, I in among practitioners, I mean, it seems to mean one public, one private. It, it, you, we don't really run into the use case, I run hybrid between four different public cloud providers and two different private cloud providers. Like, that, that seems to be, well, too private doesn't make as much sense, but, um, but uh, hybrid cloud, I, I'm getting the, 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 the sense that hybrid cloud really means two clouds, one public, one private. Uh, w what do you see there? I see people who are doing their strategic planning aspire to want to do multiple public clouds to avoid the, you know, the lock-in and, and be able to potentially negotiate on price. Though my experience in seeing negotiation attempts on public cloud providers on price is that's all commodity. They, they don't want to deal with those special cases. I mean, you have to be the Netflixes or the Zingas or, or bigger to perhaps get special treatment there. Um, so I see companies aspiring to do that, but, but again, due to the number of that, that domain knowledge that you have to acquire about what, how your private cloud works and operates and behaves, same thing with each of the different public clouds, that, that again adds to the complexity. So I think people end up getting more satisfied just with the two. So is cloud brokerage a myth or? Yeah, well, so for us, we were a little bit different. So we, we run probably at three of our own data centers uh, and several other clouds, right? And mm -hmm. Largely, that's because of the types of things we do, right? Because if you were in search, in our case, in order to get SERPs or search engine results around the world, you kind of have to be around the world to see some of those things. You can't always get them from the US. And so that then requires us to do so. Also, you can imagine if you tell someone you stop spending 800 grand at Amazon, a lot of people knock on your door and say, hey, I'll, I'll take a piece of that. So, <laughs> you know, um, so, so therefore, we, we have the ability to run in multiple places. Mm -hmm. um. <clears throat> I think it's true that that's starting to become the perception, um, but I think part of what's happening is that as a lot of enterprises wake up and they're starting to do their first private cloud, 
like whether it's the vendor or the IT teams, they realize that there's already some traction in one place or another, and they're trying to set it up so that the the folks who they're going to uh, you know deliver to are, are kind of see it as one unified system. That's sort of the dream scenario, right? Like you know if we come in and bring this hybrid cloud for you, then you know you've got one single pane of glass. You hear that all the time now that allows you to sort of like control and manage both, and it's a way to try to get things back under control if you're an IT team that has been dealing with shadow IT and the line of business is already out on Amazon Web Services, you want them to repatriate and you have to give them a really good experience. And so that, I think that's where it comes from is it's that tug of war between like, should it be external or should it be internal? And the answer is it, it depends and it's the right tool for the job type thing. Yeah. I mean, for Mark, you can tell us probably better than any of us because of the two sides you've been on. There's kind of an inflection point in which you start looking at either or. And what, what was it for you guys at Zynga and when do you see it now? There's a pretty long list that, that encouraged us to want to move back to private cloud. By the, so again, my, my experience was like 100 bare metal servers when I started, a few thousand as we were running out of space and couldn't build it fast enough, and then we exploded with Farmville onto Amazon, got to very many tens of thousands of instances there. And then that experience, it, it was a cost, it was a performance, because we had very much experience uh, knowing how well our bare metal worked, and, and it felt about half as performant in the cloud. The, the uh, lack of transparency in the public cloud, the, you know, we, had, we had disproportionate experiences of, of the scale of outages that would impact us. And again, we were running our business on this, right? So those all translated into, if we because of our scale, we could get wholesale data center space, we could make it a third the cost and twice as performant in private cloud. Mm -hmm. So that was, that's, that's what we took the, to the CFO. And the other actual inflection point too was that um, as a pre-IPO company, uh, investing in capital was actually, uh, there was interest in doing that from the CFO based on the valuation that that would kind of influence in the company. So that, that was kind of the ultimate uh, catalyst there. But again, we built this thing and then couldn't get anybody to move into it because everybody was still happy with, the, with dancing with the devil they knew than the one they didn't know. Yeah. So what it took was, uh, actually our first tenant was an acquisition. So we forced them in there. And again, that's, that's the other experience is you build this thing for a specific workload, this game company had a completely different profile. It was, we, had, we were not, no SQL in our public cloud and they were very much SQL shop. But again, it, it, it worked. And then ultimately the thing that worked is we, we found you know, a willing participant who then became our evangelist once they had moved there. They demonstrated it was twice as performant, it was a third the cost, and they were happy, you know, with, with the transparency was there. So the, the question is, uh, what were some of the difficulties? Was it the culture? You know, what, what, what causes the resistance? In my case, at, at Zynga, there really wasn't a, this concept of legacy. I, I didn't have to transform these applications to be cloud native. They were already cloud native. And the same tools could apply to both public and private. The, the challenge with, with at least the gaming company was all of that engineering talent is there to develop new features and, and things in the games, to drive new revenue, to ask them to spend some amount of cycles to migrate their applications, because we couldn't do that for them. Each game was, was different enough to, to require their involvement, and so we had to collaborate as DevOps really to do this, and so that took away their ability to innovate. And so we kind of had to start with the smaller, less revenue generating games to make them more of an evangelist, and then what worked later was the big games were so costly in, in public cloud that they, their PNL, and we were doing chargeback, their PNL would look much better once they moved because now they had data. And again, being data driven is another key is, is show, you know, doing the show back on the, on the costs around things as well as um, uh, kind of having your developers participate with you on how you're doing the infrastructure as well. We got a lot of great ideas about how to do our availability zones that really um, made them more confident in what we were building for them. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. So I, I think what you see is there's the, there's the cost and then there's just the number of features that people want to build throughout the quarter, right? So if you have, in our case, we start off small, where it's 5, 15, 25 people, right? And you're all heads down and you're just coding. You got maybe 100 boxes. All of a sudden, one day you wake up and you have 
uh, 150 people at the company and you have thousands of boxes, right? And so to tell people, hey, you're going to stop, you're going to pull all your stuff off and you're not going to develop new stuff and we're going to do this because we're going to save costs. They don't necessarily see those costs. Further, what you see also is we have devs that are coming in or engineers that for them, being in the cloud is kind of a, a cool thing, right? It's good on the resume. It looks good. I know how to manage it. And so now you have to then tell them, well, great, you're not doing that anymore. You're going to go do this other thing. And you're no longer in control of it. The DevOps people are. And so there's a, a few hurdles you have to try to get over in order to get that done. Andy? One of the things that's really tricky is that, you know, developers walking into Cloudland, maybe with only experience with the Amazon, you know, they're, they're just loving the fact that they have these APIs that they can call. They're sort of this relatively deterministic behavior. They know what they get when they do it. Um, and, you know, on Amazon and networks and networks and network mostly, EBS is EBS is EBS mostly. And But then when you go to try to hybridize and you're trying to move an application from one place to another, they get... They're not infrastructure people. They they have a disk in another place, and it suddenly doesn't operate the same way, or have the same performance, or the networks aren't the same. You know, then it gets very very confusing, and you start to be asking these guys to, can you build an abstraction layer that hides all of that <laughs> from your application? And then it gets trickier and trickier and trickier because these guys want to focus on the app capabilities and feature function, not on how it talks to networks and storage and compute and those kinds of things. Um, and we just haven't really made sort of a common substrate so that you have a guarantee as you go from cloud to cloud that it's the same. Yeah, no, no totally. So we were Dell's first, one of their first OpenStack uh, implementations uh, when they first started shipping, uh, what, three years ago? And we spent maybe 120 days tracking down a sub-second response time. And we just tore our hair out trying to figure out where that sub-second was. And so, you know, those, those sub-seconds matter, and so that was four months of dev time you just won't get back, right? Now that we have it, it's a ton of savings. However, that took us four months to figure out. Yeah, this, this, uh, something Randy said made me think of this other kind of portability thing or the, the abstraction layers. That's what a lot of the public cloud providers are trying to provide is those passes and, and those higher order functions that once you start consuming those, you're stuck. Like, uh, there may be private cloud equivalents, but they're going to be nowhere near the same. So the data gravity problem, not more of a vendor lock-in proprietary protocol problem is, is another piece that, that can lock you in. Can you say that again? Is there any? Is it the future to have a uh, hybrid, uh, hybrid cloud? Oh, oh, Docker, Docker, Docker. Docker. okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, I, I mean, I think Docker and uh, other types of things that allow you to deploy anywhere are, are definitely the future. Um, you know, we try to use those underpinnings for or something similar for everything we do. Um, so is it the future? Yes, I, I think it is. I think being able to deploy anywhere is, is uh, definitely something that we'd like to do. I think if you look at OpenStack and what it provides, or Docker and these others, you, we wanted to have the ability to not only manage the platform, but then also come up a level and manage the OS types of things that we have along with databases. So therefore the devs can then just put application on, but you know, and it doesn't really necessarily matter where it's going, it's just a matter of provisioning at that point, so. Yeah, it's a deployment, it's as a deployment and configuration tool, it's, it's awesome because you have a very controlled environment. Uh, now, we, if the question is, well, is it the future for everything? Probably not, but for at least for deployment and configuration, um, I've seen a lot of people stop using as much you know, on the chefs and puppets and and some of the configuration management tools in order to use a to consolidate around a, a container type deployment. I mean, uh, the thing is, is that I, I see some people think of Docker as sort of like completely encapsulating the application and isolating it from everything around it. Um, you know, that's basically impossible. Right. I mean, Docker does a little bit more than than that in that it'll abstract the network away and, and makes the network a little bit easier. But that introduces its own problems, which I won't go into right now. Um, but, you know, an example of this is, is that if you had Docker running in two different places and there was a 10x difference in IOPS, like Docker's not going to do anything to give you. You know, it's not going to manage, you know, make your disk drive faster. It just can't do that. It's impossible. Right. You know, one thing that I always think is really funny is that um, we build these abstractions to make our lives easier, and we like to pretend that we can kind of hide things. But the reality is, is that as you move down the stack, you get closer and closer to the physical reality. And once you hit the physical reality, the physical reality is what it is. I mean, if you're in a location like Japan, you're going to prioritize space over power. 
in a data center, which people won't do here. And that will feel its way up the stack because if you're prioritizing space over power, then you might go super, super dense because you can put, you know, 25 kVA in a rack. And that means that you're going to use, you know, potentially much higher speed processors. So your cloud may wind up having a lot more compute, you know, cycles than some other cloud. And, and so that's the reality is that you just can't get away from the physical uh, situation. I mean, no matter how much virtualization and abstractions you put in. Look, C groups is not going to add more IOPS to your disk drive. Your, your disk drive has X IOPS. It's got X IOPS. You can't add Y IOPS to X magically with Docker. That's all you have. If you go to another cloud and you're using Docker with the same application and it's got Z IOPS, it's got Z IOPS. 1,000 versus 100. That's just all there is to it. I mean, you can't fix that. If you run Docker on one cloud and it's got one gig of Ethernet coming out of the boxes that Docker's running on, and on another cloud it's got 10, <laughs> There's nothing you can, Docker cannot fix that problem. Now, Docker does do nice things like all the containers on the box look like they have their own port 80, for example, and then those are mapped out to, you know, different ports on the host uh, box so that you actually get some uh, abstractions at the network level and sort of hide certain things. But there's limitations to what you can do fundamentally. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree with you. So for us, as we move from place to place or talk to different vendors, it, it's always same hardware, same types of drives, same uh, uh, network types, and even down to network hardware, because that's the only way you can actually measure that they're the same, right? So if you tell me that you're going to give me EMC over NetApp or something like that, then um, I, I, it's harder for me to manage that and actually know what's going to happen and predict. So we always try to make it apples to apples. It's the only way around it. For us, it's a matter of deployment for the, for the devs. Sorry, there's another question. Yep. So the question is, how do you do live migration on hybrid cloud, and how do you keep the topology? What was the last one? Consistent. Consistent. Okay. Uh, Zynga's migrations were live, but they were not using the feature VM, that you're yeah. talking about. VM live migration. So the way at least gaming companies commonly move their workloads is you duplicate the environment in wherever it's going to end up. You slave your SQL or your NoSQL there so that it is concurrent with the activity that's going on. You populate all of the front end, you warm your cache, and you quiesce the first one, and you cut over to the other one. In this way, you have the ability to move back. I would be worried about using something like a real feature for live migration, if it even exists between clouds, to, to move forward and move back. Because if there is a problem where you end up, now you need to move all that data back, right? So anything that changed once it was there. W were you talking about VM live migration or yeah. just live application migration? VM. Yeah. VM, okay. No, I think, I think there's, there's I, I sense there's too much risk assuming it's a reasonably complex. If it's one server, one instance, okay, that make that, there, there's a reason, reasonable approach to that, but my experience is moving applications that are involving thousands or multiple thousands of, of distinct instances. So. You can't do it that way. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, is that I think we're all assuming that you're operating cloud native applications. Yeah, exactly. The, the request that you have about, like, would you do live migration, you know, wide area network migration of a VM, you know, that's a request that's, you know, really for non cloud native kind of legacy applications. Like, I need to move my SAP from on prem, you know, to off prem, and I need its network model to go with it. That's that's a whole use case that, you know, some people would argue that that's not even cloud. SAP isn't cloud. The stuff that's under it, you know, is virtualization. Um, and so, you know, I think that, you know, from our perspective, you know, that that's just doesn't make sense, the question you're asking, because people don't solve the problems in that way. 
Um, you know, most of the times when you do wide area migration of VM, it's just a one way, you know, thing you're doing. It's not something you would do dynamically, right? I mean, why would you move databases around like that that are many terabytes or petabytes? It doesn't make any sense. And if you've got a cloud native application, it's a shared nothing architecture. So you've all got all these tools that like, you know, auto scale your arrays, you know, whether you've got 10 app servers or 100 app servers and that same tool, you just point at the new cloud and it spins up 10 app servers. It actually, that takes much less time than <laughs> trying to move 10 app servers over the wire. And your second question? Um, uh, <laughs> One more question. Yeah, go ahead. One of my favorite articles about cloud was about Zynga, and the article suggested that you started uh, new game development in Amazon, then uh, as the game developed and, sta and stabilized and gathered popularity, you would then shift it to your private cloud. I'm kind of getting the feeling that article was bullshit now. <laughs> it, it was true for a brief time because the reality of building and investing all that capital in a private cloud meant I had to fill it, right? We, there was not any tolerance to continue to buy reserved instances or pay on-demand fees. Um, but th the time that was true was right as it was becoming available. My customers, our game studios, were still nervous and not kind of clamoring to, you know, try my new mousetrap, right? So. Once they did, every new game launched in private cloud so long as I had predictable enough capacity. And the thing that, you know, that, that was, became then the only thing. I, I didn't want another Farmville to happen. We were lucky, actually, that Farmville launched in EC2. The only reason it happened is that my data centers were full when the request came in. We had been playing with it, but we hadn't really done anything substantial. So, and, and at that time, Farmville was the fastest thing that had ever grown ever. It, was, it, it exceeded our expectations by at least two orders of magnitude. So yes, but once we got stable and predictable with the behavior of our private cloud and there was enough capacity, we'd always launch there, correct? Yeah, I'd like to add the, the good and the bad of uh, Farmville going away is my Facebook is not updated anymore. Not polluted <laughs> anymore? <laughs> No, but to your point, I, I think that that is the case for most of us, is that you, you end up starting there and you start growing and it's just cost. And I think one of the things we should point out is since then, Amazon's probably cut their prices 25, 30 times. You know, the reserve is just this year have been cut, you know, 65% in there somewhere. And so the cost is a little bit different now. So now it's a matter of uh, not only just cost, but reliability, right? And then also within their SKUs, often you end up over-provisioning because you want X amount of memory or X amount of disk space, therefore that starts to cost you more money. So that leads, leads me to one more, uh, one more myth uh, that, that, that we've been he we heard about like maybe three or four years ago, which was public cloud is cheaper. And of course that depends a lot on the workload, it depends a lot on how you're gonna build private cloud, it depends on many things. What are your opinions there? Wh what's, what's the least expensive and what types of workloads work best where? Yeah, uh, for, for us it depends. Uh, there are some things that we still you get, we use Amazon for just because it makes more sense, right? So we have thousands upon thousands of micros at Amazon. And those are types of things I don't want to build out myself and they're all over the world. And that just makes more sense to do there. And they're, from their CDN standpoint, it's a lot easier to deliver closer to customers than it is for me to do it. Mm -hmm. So we push our web apps, some of our web apps and our website to uh, places at Amazon all the way around the world so to make it faster. So those things makes more sense for us to do that way. Uh, I don't know that there's a simple answer to that. I mean, if you're going to ignore a lot of performance variables, uh, you might be able to claim public cloud is cheaper. Uh, but there's so many taxes, and th some of those taxes are around just, it's such a large environment that as soon as you're dealing with multiple nodes talking to each other, even within a, a single zone, the overhead you're paying on the microseconds between instances, it's such a huge environment that, again, a private cloud is gonna be smaller, tighter, more performant, just given its, its relative smaller size. Um, the nickeling and diming on paying for uh, provisioned IOPS, paying for all data in and out, some of those things, depending on kind of what you're expecting to pump through your, your infrastructure, those things can make it more expensive. Um, 
you kind of have to be careful and you got to make sure that you're measuring because if you, I've seen enterprise shops that are extremely dysfunctional from an IT point of view and Amazon and public cloud is almost always cheaper for them across the board. Uh, there was a, a, a big medical company on the West Coast in California that was paying $15 per terabyte for their storage of radiology images. I mean, you know, that's a little ridiculous, right? Um, uh, <laughs> <coughs> no comment? <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I, so I, it, it really does depend. Also, I've seen people who like, they come at it and they're like, well, you know, we're gonna get a V block and we're gonna put it on, and, and then if you go that route, it's just not, and, I, and we sell V blocks, they're great, but you know, if you're trying to cut cost, that's not the solution that you would go to, right? And so um, you just see people who kind of aren't really thinking through those, those conditions. Uh, one customer we talked to is uh, taking Hadoop and they're running it on Cisco UCSB series blades on top of a fiber channel SAN. Right, you're not going to see any of the Hadoop's cost economics from that. So, you know, I think it's a little. It doesn't make sense to really talk about which is cheaper. It's just mm -hmm. it's very dependent on workload, level of sophistication of the IT team. You know, how good your procurement uh, systems are, whether you've got the stomach for commodity gear. You know, and as Anthony was saying, sometimes it just depends on the workload. All right, let's let's give the audience a couple seconds to come up with a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, kind of drop the latency down to you know sub seconds. Um, have a common set of tool chain between you know multiple clouds or hybrid clouds start becoming more viable. You know, almost like you know, something beyond you know multiple data centers within a region running the same compat API compatibility layer or something. I mean, is that? It's it's not like hybrid cloud is impossible. It just there's. You really have to stop and think about, and I, I mean, I'll repeat the question. So th the question is, you know, let's say you could kind of eliminate some of these variables like API inconsistency between providers, uh, minimize kind of the variance in, in latency, and some of these other kind of undesirable, still evolving parts, right? Uh, then would hybrid cloud kind of be the best way to go? And again, it, it, you have to be very pragmatic with it. First, first, I think you need to be very strong with can you do private cloud well? Can you get that right? Get that right first before, and unless, unless you're forced into this to solve some you know, crazy workload because your app just took off, right? Um, solve for private cloud first, optimize that. You're gonna be expected to use almost all of that that you can. And then if you, if you really are as sophisticated to be able to put your app, a single app, in two different places and ensure active-active, then, then great, okay, do that. Um, a lot of people have the approach, oh, I want to have a pilot light over here. Well, you better be practicing that pilot light, you know, if you're going to do private and then have this little piece ready to go. You better practice and make sure that works. There's some kind of realistic questions of, of, of doing that. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. So it, it, not only, it has to be active-active, but I think it's also about scale. So for us, for one of our applications, there we have over a million five hundred thousand shards, right? And you really can't do that in two places. And it's even hard to back those, that many shards up. And so then when you start talking about moving petabytes of data in multiple places, you know, hundreds of petabytes, that, that becomes tough too. So it's really about being active in both places and being able to serve data from both places. So if you get a chance, you should take a look at the presentation I did at the Atlanta Summit where it's called OpenStack Architected like AWS. And when I am talking about, you know, you need to build your cloud with intent, I mean, it kind of goes to what Mark is saying. You can't just pretend that some of these things are going to appear. You actually have to make them appear. And when uh, when I did that presentation, you know, I really sat down very hard and I said, what what does hybrid cloud mean? What does interoperability mean? Like, what are the, all the elements? And I came up with six areas, you know, performance, availability, cost, um, you know, behavioral compatibility, API compatibility, you know, and really tried to break it down. And I think, you know, you, there, if you go and you see that presentation, you'll see there's a lot of thinking there about, you know, what are all the aspects so that you can stack them up and you can measure between, you know, the two clouds you're trying to hybridize and understand if you're actually going to get the experience that you expect. But again, it's going to have to be with intent and, and you know, deliberateness. One, one last point on that, too, is the behavioral compatibility, right? Again, one of the other reasons why Zynga didn't end up putting single apps across two clouds is there's never going to be identical performance out of a web instance in pri our private cloud versus an EC2 or a Google anywhere. 
And for something, again, this is workload dependent, for something that we care about that consumer's experience playing the game, we want it to be performant, reliable, and consistent. When you have two different things that are serving that out, you cannot guarantee that. Well, that and I, I think the one thing to leave with is in, in the hybrid, uh, when we talk about being hybrid, it sounds like neither one of us did it with intent, right? We, we didn't intend to do that, right? It was something that was a byproduct because something else happened to us. And so I think if you go into it planning and knowing and you have the, the ability and the luxury to plan it out, it's a whole different thing. So, so what are the problems that hybrid cloud solves? For us, it, it's now we can balance workloads and the types of things and do it efficiently, and we can do it cost effectively. And so for us, it's a matter of now we can plan because we have the capacity internally and we have it externally. I'm going to call that multi-cloud. Multi-cloud solves yeah. kind of mm -hmm. the operational disparity that you would otherwise, you would assume when you have two different things. Hybrid cloud to me means I'm running a single app in multiple clouds. And again, there are cautionary statements for that. Mm -hmm. Where, it, where that does come into reality, though, is you have that app that takes off, surprise, surprise. I, I worked with a customer whose back-end persistent data store couldn't operate successfully at, at scale in EC2 for them. So they rushed to provision raw bare metal for their MongoDB back-end. And then they put that front-end in, Am in Amazon, continued that there, and had the back-end function for them. So that, for them, was hybrid cloud, although the private mm -hmm. part was bare metal. Um. Sorry, I'm a little punchy. I didn't get as much sleep as I wanted. Last <laughs> um, so, you know, one of the things that I think is really funny is that, um, uh, you know, people are still getting a lot of value from public cloud, right? The reality of the situation is that um, a lot of the time you don't know what's going to happen, and public cloud really reduces the cost of failure. You know what I'm saying? I mean, in the in the old days, I'm no, I'm sure people remember, but in the late '90s, if you wanted to launch a new SaaS service, you you were going to put you know millions of dollars of investment into like making it go. And you look at somebody like Netflix, all in on Amazon Web Services, and you're like, wow, you know, it's a little crazy. You could be running a cheaper operation, yeah. But then they just pointed over to EMEA, and they went bunk, and Netflix is suddenly in Europe. You know, a few hours later, like that's powerful, right? And so th that reducing the cost of failure, allowing you to have global reach, there's still really great use cases for a public cloud. You should not be afraid of it. Um, and that's part of why I think hybrid matters. Um, but again, you, you've got to do the practical realities. Uh, front row. No. No. <laughs> Go ahead. So, so the question is, what do we think of the uh, the OpenStack public clouds? I'll have a quick, quick comment here. Federated um, OpenStack public clouds. Yeah, federated uh, open. So, um, one thing I noticed. So, uh, again, like uh, the, the 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 project I built, Scalar, um, talks to all the different public cloud providers. Um, in working with the OpenStack APIs, we've noticed that um, it seems that all the uh, OpenStack public cloud providers use different APIs. Um, so, for example, we had we were forced to have different libraries, whether it we're using OpenStack from Trunk, OpenStack from Cloud Scaling, or OpenStack from Rackspace. Um, it, like specifically, Rackspace, like their networking is different. A uh, whole bunch of things are different. So, so like when you when you do a quick glance at the Rackspace APIs, they seem they 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 use the same words um, as as OpenStack, but there's semantically they're different. Uh, go ahead. I mean, OpenStack, I, 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 I can't believe I'm going to say this for like the fifth year running. Uh, OpenStack, <laughs> you know, is not a cloud operating system. It's more like a cloud operating system kernel, right? And so people, you know, download it and then they build their own thing, you know, whether it's as a product or a bespoke cloud. And when they do, it's like taking the Linux kernel and building Android, which is running the Linux kernel, and building Cray Linux, which is running the Linux kernel, and building RHEL, which is running the Linux kernel. But I guarantee you have zero application portability between those, and all the application exactly. interfaces are yeah. different. But it's still all Linux, and it's all still the same code. Exactly. It may even be the same version of Linux, but you've got no compatibility. So right now, the problem is in, in OpenStack public cloud land that we have lots and lots of snowflakes. So federation is like very far away. I mean, there are some there are some bright lights. I don't know if this is the right form to talk about them. Um, you know, Def Core and RefStack can give us a way to sort of test interoperability, which may make this cleaner, and then we can get to federation. But we're a, a long way away from it right now. Can I add a comment about that? I think 
there's a, I think there's an issue with, I know the customers want federation uh, between, you know, let's say HP and Rackspace for obvious reasons, but I'm not sure the vendors are so willing to. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I, there's a push from the consumer of the OpenStack clouds to, to have interoperability and standardization. The problem is, is that OpenStack exists because it's got an inclusive attitude and it's, it tried to have a big tent and have as many people around the table as possible. With all those people around the table, they all want to take it a different direction. And so, you know, if we continue to look at it as sort of being a complete product, then you know we that, then we can't get it right. But you know, if you if you try to port an application from a rail box to a rail box. It works. If you try to port it from Rail to Suze, it doesn't work. So, you know, I think people need to be having their heads that what the right way to consume OpenStack is via product. Yes, I have a product, so you know, take it with a grain of salt. And um, you know, but you know, raw OpenStack just leads you to a bunch of um, challenges. Yeah, but I, I'd add to that. For for us, the it's really not OpenStack to OpenStack. For us, it's the Swift stack. So in order to let the devs just put data wherever they want it and just have it work, that's kind of the thing that works the same. The OpenStack piece going from uh, Rackspace to Amazon to others, it really doesn't. What happens is we just cut a ticket until it works exactly how we want it to. We just sit there and complain, and then eventually we get there. And so, you know, it, and that takes time, right? I think it takes, it took us about three to four weeks before we got to work at Rackspace. We went over to Google, and of course it worked totally different, right? So. Great question. All right, I think we have a time for one more question. Who's the who's going to be the lucky person? Quick. All right, no lucky person. All right, well everyone, thank you very much for uh, for listening in on this panel. Hope you got enough. <laughs> uh, we'll stick around. If you have got any questions, you can come up to us personally. Thank you very much. <laughs>